Welcome back to Season 5 of CX in the Wild, where we capture conversations with the leading voices of customer experience from around the world. Let's start with who you are and what you do. Hey, Dennis. This is uh, Sean Minter. I'm the founder and CEO of Amplify. Amplify focuses on helping companies engage, develop, and uh, recognize their top, their top employees. Uh, I should probably rephrase that. I mean, use our standard messaging. I was trying to go a little extra towards experience. <laughs> I love it. I, I love how authentic you are right there. Let, you know, let's take it even further back. Yeah. I met you through Adrian, mm -hmm. who I had seen in the industry. He's a great guy. He does a lot of networking, yeah. and we we got to talking. I met you. Yeah. You've had a couple of successful tech ventures yeah. prior to this. Mm -hmm. Can you just give me like uh, the ramp up? You had a couple. Did you have yeah. some big wins and some big losses, or just all big wins? No, one big loss, but the rest were wins. Um, it's just like kind of history. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's pretty good, interesting history. So I graduated from college with an engineering degree out of Ohio State. Telecom boom in Dallas. I think I got recruited down here with MCI. Like one block over is where I started working back when I was in my early 20s. And uh, I got involved. MCI was a pretty entrepreneurial company. They were trying to do a lot of things. I got involved in a group that was actually pretty entrepreneurial, which kind of ticked off that kind of mindset. Um, we were trying to get into the local service business. It was getting deregulated. Um, then at and hired me because they wanted to kind of learn what MCI was doing and get in the local service business themselves. So I ended up working uh, for at and trying to do the same thing. I actually got in a lot of regulatory work. I was at the State Public Utility Commissions testifying on debundling and unbundling of deregulation, a whole bunch of other stuff. So I got involved in some legal aspects because of my engineering degree and being able to talk to regulators. But then when deregulation happened, um, we negotiated all these agreements for at and to get in the local service business and lease all these local phone lines to get your phone service, all these other things. But at and couldn't get up and running for several years because they have, you have to build systems or a big corporate entity. So a bunch of us decided to leave at and and start the first competitive local exchange carrier here in the Texas market to bring, to bring basically phone, local phone service competition. Before then, it was just a monopoly through Southwestern Bell. So I started a company called Alt Communications. A bunch of us from at and left. You know, being engineers and regulatory people, we knew how to get the contracts in. We knew how to get the systems up and running and get it all going. The thing that none of us knew, which we thought was going to be easy, was sales. Like, oh, how hard can it be when you go to somebody and say, I can just save you 20% sign here. You don't do anything. Well, that became a lot harder than we expected because nobody wanted to sign, <laughs> sign the paperwork. It was kind of unknown at that time. It was unknown. Plus, like, uh, sales is hard just because, like, 20% of the company is selling two, three hundred dollars on phone bills, like 50 bucks are worth the risk. Our phone service goes down, right? There's all these all these issues. So, but we were all engineers. So think we had the engineering mindset of like, why would somebody not want to save money? Like it's gonna be easy. You go to everybody and they'll sign. Well, none of nobody would sign. Like we had no customers. Um, so we had to learn, right? I had to learn how to do sales, knocking on doors, going to restaurants and bars and trying to convert them to phone service and churches. I mean, that was going up and down the highways, right? The businesses was our business. And if we didn't learn sales, we we're going to go out of business. So I, I had to go learn how to sell door to door. And that's how I learned how to do sales. Can uh, I, you know, I'm going to stop yeah. right there. Because so much of what I learn about people yeah. is, you know, not just what they do, yeah. but how they evolve. And yeah. you really talked about having an engineering degree, this regulatory piece of your life. Yeah. To move from that space to have your mind and your, 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 just your mind open yeah. to the transformation that it takes to go from all that logic to yeah. the unknown. Yeah. That I just commend you on that. So it sounds like you yeah. eventually learned how to do sales. I mean, I think, so, I think you're an entrepreneur, right? So you kind of see, you have to have that kind of mindset because you're going to get hit with problems you have no idea how to solve. True. You just have to like work it's your so, way through it. It's so and there's true. no option. There's no like, there's some other expert at my company that can go solve this for me. And you can't blame anyone else. There's, <laughs> There's no other it. reason except I, yourself. Yeah. So you have, I think overcoming challenges is the key to being a successful entrepreneur. If you don't know how to do that, you just give up too easily. Or you just like don't know how to solve challenges and problems and just work your way through them. Um, you won't ever be an entrepreneur. You shouldn't. That's not a place for you. Uh, so I think that's a common trait, I think, for anybody that's successful that I know that's an entrepreneur is like, you just have a will to just 
things to get things done. Otherwise, it just won't get done. And you just have the, the, the perseverance, I think, of just like working your way through it, not giving up. So true. So that first business, it was yeah. successful, it sounds yeah, like? It was, it was successful. We actually didn't even raise any money. We built it up to a decent-sized company. We sold it to a company called Birch Telecom that had a, that had a uh, long-distance business out of Kansas City. It was funded by KKR. And it did well. Um, so the next thing, so the next business is, all right, this is like 97, 98. Again, the telecom boom, now the internet boom is happening. Yeah. Right? Um, and uh, broadband is just coming into play. Everybody's still on AOL and dial-up. Uh, there's very little broadband out there. So we see the cable companies, the phone companies trying to do broadband in the big cities. So given our telecom background, I'm like, okay, we're going to go and deploy broadband into the second tier cities, right? Because nobody's focusing on that. And because it should be easy. Actually, that business was easy from a sales perspective because getting people to switch from dial-up to broadband is easy. Getting the broadband to work was the hard part, right? Because it was still early technology, yeah. getting all that stuff working. So we actually, over time, over a three-year period, raised almost $300 million and deployed a broadband network across Texas, the Southwest Bell region, the Ameritech region, which goes up to you know, the Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan area, and then the Pac Bell region, which is California and Nevada, into the second and third tier markets. Um, but then the 9-11 uh, hit and all the uh, you know, stock market sank. A lot of the broadband business is funded with debt, and our primary funder for equipment was Lucent. Lucent filed oh, yeah, for bankruptcy. Sorry. I remember that. Right? And Lucent's going out of business. They provide all the equipment for our network. Now they're now we're stuck in their bankruptcy situation because we owe them a lot of money um, because they're providing, they funded the debt. They funded their equipment through loans to us. Um, so all that kind of goes down, crashing down because no, no, nobody in bankruptcy wants to work anything out. Uh, so end up being, we end up selling to level three just for the cost of the equipment. Like we don't make any money. Um, that's great. Next business says, all right, now that there's broadband, what do you do next, right? So next is, okay, we have companies that have phone lines and phone systems, and all those are not on the broadband network. Well, they can be. This is before Vonage existed, right? So this is like Vonage for business. So we're like, okay, now, now that we know we know how to do phones, local phone service, we know how to do broadband, the next step is how to move that phone service into, onto the broadband network and off the phone lines. So we built up a company called Reallinks that was hosted PBX in the cloud before there was... Amazon, AWS, right? You had to have your own data centers. Uh, so we built up a whole cloud voice network, uh, did a hosted PBX, just went to businesses and said, hey, you're buying broadband. I can sell you the broadband because I have a wholesale agreement with Southwest and Bell and the, and the cable companies. Um, I can provide your voice service over our broadband network and I can put your routers and security in front of it. So I can kind of provide you a bundle of everything you need. Um, and we kind of built that up, you know, sold it through an agent channel, got that up to like 50, 60 million in revenue. A bunch of old MCI guys that started another long distance company that went public called GTT, so they bought us. Okay, and so then, yeah. so, so you've learned a lot. You you have such a tech engineering, but I also think you have a insight on experience on the evolution of the technology and its utility in in the business ecosystem. But now you have this venture. How did all that experience end up? How did you? Yeah, how did that we end up in call centers? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, really, it ended up as one of our investors in that company that uh, is, was a broadband company that, that, we, that was taken over by Lucent uh, was a group out of uh, Credit Suisse First Boston back then. So they were a big uh, investment banking firm that invested in us. And some of those guys left and started a private equity firm that bought a BPO called PRC out of South Florida. So I'd known them for a long time. We'd worked together for a long time. That company wasn't doing well. So they asked me as a consultant to go say, you don't know much about this business, but now you've had call centers for all your telecom companies. So you know call centers. Uh, go tell us what's happening here. Right? So we ended up going into that company. Uh, obviously, just, just like in any company that's doing not doing well, most of the time it's the leadership. Right? The people in the call centers, the directors, the ops people, right? they're all working their tail off, doing the best they could. So we basically, you know, removed the entire C-level leadership team. I ended up taking over because we had to go through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy to get rid of real estate and a whole bunch of other things. So we had to restructure that company. But I ended up running this call center business with like 15,000 people. And and managing that, like not coming from the call center industry, like I would sit with a customer and they would ask me like, why does this site perform well and this site doesn't perform well? Why are these teams over here doing good and these teams over here not doing good? And there's no good answer, right? And people are in that industry are just used to just making, 
making stuff up, but there's no good, real good answer for that question. Like why you do the exact same thing in both centers. You hire the same people, put them through the same training, manage them the exact same way. But some are good and some are not good. And that's just, you just accept it. And people came from that industry, but I didn't accept it. Like there has to be a way of like, and you can only throw labor at the problem. You can like throw more training, throw more coaching, throw more leaders. If that doesn't work, get rid of some people, put some new people in, maybe they'll fix it. Um, that's, that's what people can do in the call center industry. So I was like, I had that problem at PRC. So I started solving for that problem out there. Let me sold that company to Lorica. Uh, and then I started Amplified to really focus on solving that issue. Because I know every one of my customers has that problem in their internal call centers. Okay, so every VPO has it as well. Before we run yeah. into that, I'm, I'm just fascinated because so many times I talk to people who have reached an executive level. They've started on the front lines, maybe at the call center. Mm -hmm. But you have come at this industry sort of adjacent and at the top. And yeah. you have a different motivation than building your career. Your entire mental focus is about solving problems to drive revenue for bigger organizations, it sounds like. Just solving problems. Like that's kind of the engineering mindset. If you see a problem, you're trying to figure out how to, okay. how to solve it. But let me ask you this. Yeah. In the engineering mindset, do you, because I'm not an engineer, yeah. do you, when you see a problem, do you identify it as a, a problem that can be solved? How do you distinguish between a real, a challenge that can be solved or mm. should be solved or improved mm. versus something that, is, isn't relevant to the overall good. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. like a building, like a building, engineering a building. Yeah. Uh, maybe there is a way to fix one thing, but yeah. there are certain things like that's just how it is. Yeah. How do you differentiate that? Well, I mean, I think in this case, the, the problem was people were manually trying to solve the problem in ineffective and efficient ways. And I wasn't sure there was a better way, but, but there's, no, until you know, there's no way to know until you try it, right? So the concept of Amplify is what we started trialing is, can I find a better way to solve that problem? Not getting rid of people, but using technology to make the people more effective at solving it versus just letting them through brute force at it. Right now they were trying to solve it with brute force. Like we have to be able to solve this problem with a little more intelligence and, and enabling those people to do a better job. Because the one I think this is generally, like I would go talk to people that aren't performing in the call centers and then none of them are like, I come to work to do a bad job. I yeah. think on average, outside of a few percentage of people, like everybody comes to work to try to do the best job they can. Yeah. And then some of them are able to do a good job, some of them aren't. And do you blame the people who aren't able to do a good job on their will? Probably not, right? You just did not prepare them or their team leader did not prepare them or you did not give them the, the feedback they needed to improve them. And that's generally the case. It's not like I have 20% of my employees that are just coming to work to do a bad job every day and not just have to accept that to be a fact. Fair enough. Like that's, I think that you know, some percent of the industry just gets, has gotten used to that. They're like, well, I'll just trip them away and get some new people. And that's my solution to the problem. Well, that's not the solution to the problem either because you'll just constantly be in an attrition loop, which is what happens in a lot of call centers too. So this, this challenge of how do I really get people and enable them to do the best job they can causes performance challenges and attrition challenges, right? So like that, that is a wor problem worthy of, worthy of a solution. Okay. And how, how did you tackle yeah. that? How, let's talk about this solution. Yeah. Let's just talk about. So, and feel free to speak from the engineering yeah. perspective. What, how did you start? How did you yeah. take me from the, so you identify yeah. the problem. Take me to that, to where you are now yeah. in the solution. I mean, like, thinking about it, like breaking down, like the, every problem can be broken down into components, right? So the first component of the problem is, what is it that you're trying to solve in more detail, right? So we're trying to solve this, but what we're really trying to solve for is, to solve that problem we're really trying to solve for is, how do I really know the difference between the people that are doing good and the people that are not doing good, right? Like, how do I understand and judge what that difference is? Because otherwise, it's just, I have some metrics, but that just tells me at a high level, right? For me to solve the problem, I need to understand the details of exactly what are they doing differently. So it all comes down to measurement and better understanding of exactly what they do building the, the profiles for these people. So it's, it's very, I think if you think about a very Six Sigma engineering oriented solution, what Amplify does, it just takes all your people and puts all that performance into a view and you'll end up with some sort of bell curve, right, of people. Um, high performers, average performers, low performers, that curve may shift left to right, but it'll always be a, 
some sort of bell curve. When you took a lot of people into, a, into measuring something, you'll always end up with a bell curve. And then you're like, okay, how do I know what these high performers are doing? Because ultimately, that's what I want these people to do. But I can't go tell them what to do and how to change or be better until I know what these people are doing. So how do I bring all their data right from all their different systems into one place so I can better understand exactly what they do? And that's a challenge for most contact centers, right? They have their data spread everywhere. They have spreadsheets over here, reports over here, dashboards over here, got people looking at all this stuff. They have no idea. Like, what do these high performers do? What's the difference? There's a lot of, that's where a lot of randomness in the call centers happen is you throw all this data at all these people, all these reports and from tools and surveys and all oh, workforce management and QA and all this stuff and say, go, here's a bunch of information. I believe you're an expert data analyst. Go figure out how to make it happen. Well, none of those team managers are expert data analysts. We just throw all this stuff at them. We cross our fingers and we hope they know what to do with it. And they don't. Now you're putting them in a position to fail, right? You're making them try to do a job. They're not really, you didn't hire them to do that. You, you hired them to be team leaders, right? You hired them to coach people, make people better, not be data analysts. So, so to me, the root cause of the problem is when we don't know what the people do and the people that have to go make people better don't know how to use the data to understand what the difference is, right? So I got to start first is understanding what the high performers are doing, bring all the data to one place, then understand how to take that information and give it to the people who can action it, which are team leaders, the coaches, right? Because they can action that data to make these other people better. So it's really just breaking down the problem. I got to first understand what the problem is, what is the variance, who can action it? Like Amplify could go tell an agent what they need to get better at. 99% of the time, they won't get better at it. This is a system sending you an email saying, get better at this, doesn't make you better. You got to have a person sit with you, coach you, role play with you, how to teach you what you're doing. So that's why we didn't go down the path of like a lot of companies where we're going to try to like, hey, you can solve all your problems with AI. So I'm just going to give you information. I think expecting somebody to just ingest information and just become better uh, from reading something is, a, is also a bad expectation. I think people need practice and need interaction to become better at things. So we went down the path of, let's make those team leaders better. Let's give them what they need. Because if you make them better, they make their people that work for them better, right? That's, and if you look at Amplify, that's what the core of our business is. is figure out from the data what the good people are doing. How do I make this person do what the good people do? And let their team leader know what they need to coach them on and help them with. And if you can do that at scale, that's how you solve performance problems. So is it, is it really... It's really about at the end of the day, because it sounds weird yeah. talking to an engineer. Yeah. You're saying it's really about the people in the organization sharing their experiences with others based on this new perspective they have through the software? I think the, the software guides them into understanding what each one of their people needs help with, right? So if you have a team of 15 people, every one of those 15 people needs help with something different. But you don't really know from looking at the data exactly what they need help with. So Amplify One solves that problem for you, right? Which is now you know exactly what every one of your people needs help with. And now you can focus your time and effort and brain power on becoming good at helping them versus becoming good at looking at data, trying to understand what to they report. need Because you yeah. can't do both. You only have so much time in the day and so much brain power. If you spend all your time and brain power trying to figure out what, what people need help with, you don't have time and brain power to actually go help them. So we are removing that burden off of you so you can just focus on making your people better so is it almost like a transformation in leadership and augmentation to leadership having amplify as a solution oh 100 you could call it you could somewhat call amplify as an assistant for different roles in a contract center or an assistant for that team leader basically guiding them on exactly what they should do and how they should do it and who they should help or an assistant to that agent right telling them exactly how they're doing how they compare to people um you know, help, uh, helping them understand what they need to get better at, understand what they're doing good at, right? So they have a good understanding of where they stand when their team leader talks to them. It's not a surprise that I'm not good at something or I need help with something. Um, the operations managers now also get a view of sort of what are their team leaders coaching? Are they actually good at it? Now, just because I can give a team leader a very specific task to go make Dennis better at this because Dennis needs help with it. But how do we know that person actually knows how to make you better at it? Right, that's the other 50% of the problem. The first 50% of the problem is I give you the right thing to do. The second 50% of the problem is it's a bad expectation for me to think you're good at everything and you should be able to make one of your agents better at everything. Right, that's also a bad expectation. You're a person, you're going to be good at some things, even if you're a team leader, you're not going to be good at some things. So how do I now better understand? That's another big hole in call centers. Like what, what do you know how to coach? 
What do you not know how to coach, right? What do you actually make good at making people better at? Nobody knows. They're like, oh, my team leaders are coaches. They can coach everything. That's not true. Right? You, may, you may want that to be true, but that is not true. Uh, so Amplify now started understanding by the actions we give the team leaders, what are they actually good at improving people on what they're not? And now we drive an action to their manager to say, let's coach the coach. Let's make this team leader better at coaching these things because he or she is not better at it. And, and, and when, we, so you identify, so it sounds like you identify where the weaknesses are and yeah. the strengths. Yeah. You can play to the strengths, improve the weaknesses. Yeah. You can do that through the augmentation of the humans in the system. So yeah. you're coordinating the, the, the systems with the humans yeah. to create better outcomes. How does the input to the trainers and the coaches get into this system? Yeah, so you know that's that's also uh, from an implementation perspective something we have to spend a lot of time on on our side to make sure we make it very easy for clients because the number one problem that anybody would have in ever buying Amplify is how do I get all my data to you? And, and the other part is I can't have my IT team do a lot of work because I don't want to have enough of them and they're too busy doing other things and I'll never get you implemented if you have to make them do a lot of work. So we've actually built this entire platform to be very efficient and ingesting data. We partnered with almost 150 other companies that are in the ecosystem. Every CRM tool, every CCAS vendor, every quality tool, because we're not competitors to them, right? We're not doing their job. We just want to use their data, um, which actually makes them stickier because we're using their data to make people better. Um, so none of them see us as threats. We're partnered with all of them. We connect into their data sources. We have connectors into all of them. So we built an entire platform that lets you connect all of your data sources and amplify very easily. As a company, you don't even need IT people to do anything on your side. So, and that's where your history of engineering, telecom, compliance, regulation, yeah. your mind is just built to integrate all of the systems yeah. rapidly. So, you leverage that to create the strong ecosystem. Yeah. And also, you know, that's a big sales fr friction in the sales process, right? Like, I can get you as yeah. a company wanting to buy me as an operations leader. But, oh, I love you. I wish I could have you, but I can't because my IT team can't put the data together to give it to you in a format you need it. Yeah. Now, how do we solve? We solve that problem because we know every customer we talk to will have that problem, right? Every customer. Can has we just that pause for a second? Yeah. Not only do they have the problem, it's, it's like the biggest hurdle. When I've worked in different organizations, I've had, I've had solutions, identified solutions yeah. that would create significant value, and the IT team is in a position where the infrastructure is maximized to the revenue available, yeah. and there becomes this fear of, if we take something down or introduce something new to the system, and it interrupts the current flow of revenue, yeah. and that, that creates, it's yeah. a real concern at big companies, and, and you're saying, you, your thing doesn't have any impact on IT? No, minimal. And they, they just give us the data. They're already giving it to, to their call centers in whatever format they have it, all the way they're feeding it into the data warehouses. We don't need them to adjust or modify or do anything with what they're doing today. Just take those existing feeds they already have and just point them in our direction. How long does that take? Like, what is what does that ask for an IT department, really? Because well, every like even yeah. the smallest task yeah. drives an IT department crazy yeah. if they're over... That's true. I mean, if you look at kind of our overall implementation process from beginning to end for a client that's brand new for their first contacts in their first line of business, it's about 90 days. You know, only, only about 60 of that is actually the technology implementation. The 30 of that is really us working with our operations team to really define the requirements, right? Because putting an Amplify lets you do two things as a, as a customer. It lets you look at not just putting on a new technology to help you drive what you currently do better, but how can you also change your process to be more efficient and effective? Because there's no point in putting in a technology into a bad process, right? You can only get so much performance. And we bring in best practices as we evaluate your operation. How are you coaching? What are you coaching people on? Are you really doing the right things? And companies get get improvements from Amplify from those two reasons. They implement a process, a, stand, a system that standardizes how they should action their data and, and work on everybody. But two, also changes all those bad habits on who's coaching, who's not coaching, how much should I coach? Like There's a lot of variation that happens. And you standardize processes along with it. And I just, I want to be sensitive because what the listeners don't know is you've been, you had traveling, big travel schedule yesterday, 
you've made this time for me. You, you've been up all night. So I just, yeah. I hate to throw these complex yeah. questions at you. So I just want to thank you for even explaining all of this. If I was sleep deprived, which I am often, I just, I can't answer all these questions. So just yeah. deep breath and thank you. Yeah. I want to just ask a couple of other key points and then I, I will, we'll let you get some rest. It's, uh, how long has Amplify been in operation? Um, six years. Six years. And in that six years, how many, are you at liberty, you can say pass, but are you at liberty to say how many clients roughly you've onboarded in that six years? Yeah, I think overall we're 175,000 contact center agents around the world. Of that, that's probably like 75 different clients, each client having 10, 15 different lines of business. So that's a decent quantity of you know, so, clients, lines of business, and, and quantities of users. So I'm going to just generalize because, yeah. okay. but I'm just going to say it's fair to say that in the six years, you've onboarded 100,000 plus agents. Yeah. Okay. And what you're saying is that process, it, because I think when I try to bring news to my audiences, you're a relatively new company, six years. Yeah. You have a history of regulatory compliance at scale for telecom industry. You're an engineer. This new solution, you recently deployed it for a hundred thousand plus agents. And if I'm a listener and I think, I might be a couple of things. I might be, I might have inherited a, a new role at, with a call center in my organization. There might be some changes and we have to spin up a call center yeah. or, but any leader who is at an, a transition point with their call centers, yeah. you can bring this, this, pardon my expression, yeah. that a template yeah. of, best practices over a hundred thousand other agents you can you can connect their data sources without being too intrusive mm -hmm. and then and the net result is the human beings in the call center mm -hmm. begin to is it safe to say radiate better leadership and the outcome is better business intelligence, better leadership. So it's like this harmony of, of people and technology. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good way of putting it, right? Like, I mean, I always put about, put like, how do I, my measurements of people in the three categories, right? You always have to measure people on their productivity and efficiency, the quality and compliance to what you're trying to do, and then the business results they provide. And you really need all three, right? I can't have like people that are doing really good at sales, but are like very unproductive. I don't want them. I need people that are good at being productive, that are, that are doing it in a good quality way, being compliant with with regulations and and things like that, uh, and and being good with customer experience and delivering sales, CSAT, and PS results at the same time. Um, so think about Amplify as if you're built, have a contact center and your number one cost is labor. For less than one percent of what you pay your people, I can help you make them ten to twenty percent more effective, more compliant, and more delivering better results for less than one percent of what you pay them. And I want to just yeah. challenge those numbers because everybody throws numbers out. But I think you're you're spitballing those numbers based on the hundred thousand agents you've serviced, or yeah. how did you get to that number of like that's yeah. that's a pretty big claim. Yeah, I mean, if, I, mean I think it's really like, we've actually never lost a direct client in our life that ever has ever come on Amplified has never left. Right? If you look at our history of customers, we've never actually lost a customer. Only customers that ever leave a customer we have through a BPO or the BPO loses a customer and like they they leave Amplify because they're not with the BPO. But any direct customer we have, we've never lost a direct customer. Once they go in, they pilot it. Like I'll give you an example. Like Home Depot started a pilot four years ago with 80 people. Now they have 15,000 people, right? On Amplify. But they didn't go from 80 people to 15,000 people without proving. And it's a, one of the largest retailers, so that second or third yeah, largest sure. retailer in the world. Right? They have very good processes, approvals, finances involved in checking off everything. And the millions of dollars a year they pay us is generating 10 times the return for them. So it works. Yeah. And, and big, giant brands, but you can do this. Like, is, are you, is there only the giant brands? Like, how, how far into the mid market can you go where it's an equitable cost benefit time 
uh, a proposition for you and the brand? I think if you're a, if you have a hundred plus frontline associates, which means you'll probably have now anywhere from ten to you know or so team leaders, kind of managing that that population of people. Um, I think that's an effective population for us. If you have your contact center of twenty people, like there's no reason for you to have the complexity of trying to put something like Amplify into management. Right? If you're twenty people, you should be able to know what's going on with all twenty at any given time. But um, if you have a hundred and you're scaling, yeah, if you're a hundred, hundred and fifty and scaling, and and especially with remote work now, right? I mean. Managing and understanding people and where they are and not having them right there to be able to understand their metrics. Like Amplify is built to drive these categories of performance, productivity, quality, and, and business results in a remote work environment because we enable that. Uh, how do I drive performance for remote work? Well, Amplify solves that problem for you. All right. I love all that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time today. If you had any advice... Here, I'm going to ask you a question I've never asked anyone else before because you have come from other industries and come in from the top. So often I work, I talk to people who are climbing. First of all, in an organization, who is the person in the organization that you feel your advice would be most valuable for? I think the leader of a contact center, no, like the director of VP is responsible for a contact center. Ultimately, they have to deliver the results that, that the organization wants from them is the key kind of owner buyer of Amplify because we're solving that person's problem. And, and what, what advice would you give that person for 2024? I mean, I would say look at the people in your contact center as your number one asset, right? And how do you maximize their capability, enable them, retain them, uh, and drive performance from them as your number one problem you're trying to solve, right? The end result is the end result you're going to get. But that's what you're trying to solve is how do I take my most important asset? How do I maximize their capability uh, so I can get a, a huge return from making them better? That's what Amplify does. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to CX in the Wild. If you'd like to be on the show, connect with us through the link in the description or DM Dennis on LinkedIn. 